Good health insurance doesn't have to be expensive. At AmBetter from Peach State Health Plan, our plans are better for your budget. We provide complete care at a much lower cost. And you may qualify for financial assistance to help pay for your coverage. Sign up for the most affordable care today. Call 1-844-292-4328. That's 1-844-292-4328. This is a solicitation for insurance. Blog Talk Radio. Good morning and welcome to the Parenting Aces radio show presented by TennisBalls.com. On Blog Talk Radio's You Are Tennis Network, we are so happy to be back with you in 2017 and excited for the year ahead. There are a lot of great shows coming up on our schedule over the next few weeks, and uh, I'm looking forward to chatting with our upcoming guests on a variety of topics relating to junior tennis and college tennis. And I want to just say a big old thank you to TennisBalls.com. You heard that right in the intro. They are now a presenting sponsor of the Parenting Aces radio show. For those of you unfamiliar with TennisBalls.com, it is a global website covering all aspects of tennis, but mainly focused on the professional side of things. And I urge you all to check it out. TennisBalls.com will keep you up to date on happenings around the world in terms of tournaments and players and coaching changes and agent changes and all sorts of behind-the-scenes info and photos uh, from the tennis world. And I just am so grateful to the folks at TennisBalls.com for choosing to sponsor our little show this year and hope we can make them proud. So thanks, guys. And to my listeners, please show them some love and uh, check out TennisBalls.com. So today we have on our show Martin Blackman, who is the head of player development for the USTA. And Martin and I have traded messages over the past couple of years, and I'm just so excited to finally get him on the show. He is a busy, busy guy, and especially now with the opening of the new mega facility in Lake Nona, Florida, I'm sure his time is just crazy, crazy. But um, I'm very excited to have him on today. A few folks have texted or emailed me some questions for Martin, but I urge you, if you're listening live to the show, to feel free to call in uh, and ask your questions of Martin, and and he's a great guy, and I'm sure we'll be more than happy to take questions from our listeners. That number to call in is 714-583-6853. Again, 714-583-6853 is our call-in number. And I'm going to bring Martin on the line in just a few minutes. Um, He was busy until (laughs) until right at 1130. So I'm going to give him a minute to catch his breath before I bring him on. But um, I do want to remind you guys that the college dual match season is going to be getting underway in the next couple of weeks. The ITA kickoff weekend is the last weekend of January at sites all around the U.S. And so I urge you to – Go to the ITA's website and find out where the events are close to you and take your kids and go out and watch some fabulous college tennis. These events are typically free of charge and open to the public, and so um, check them out and go support your favorite teams. I will be heading out to the West Coast to Los Angeles for the ITA kickoff at UCLA, and I'm looking very forward to that and hope to provide some coverage of that event to you guys. So if you're going to be out at UCLA that weekend, please let me know and let's connect while I'm there. I'll be, I'll be out at the matches both days, Saturday and Sunday. So look forward to seeing some of the Parenting Aces crew out there. All right, let me try and get Martin on the line. Let's uh, see if we can get him connected. And I know y'all are anxious to hear from him and tired of hearing my voice here. Let's see if we can get him on. Martin here. Hey, Martin. It's Lisa with Parenting Aces. You are live on the air. How are you? I'm doing great, thank you. It's a beautiful day here in Orlando. (laughs) Lucky you. Um, It's beautiful in Atlanta, too. Just 
very, very chilly. We've been playing ice tennis here for the last week or so. It's uh, not my favorite conditions, that's for sure. Got it. It's about 60 degrees and sunny here, so um, perfect weather <laughs> if, you don't have, if you don't have thin blood like a lot of Floridians do. <laughs> Sounds perfect <laughs> to me. Sounds perfect. Well, I Happy New Year to you, and thank you Happy for New being Year. on the show. And I, I know your life is crazy busy with the opening of the new facility down there. So um, let's just jump right into this thing. And I would love to have you chat a little bit about the new facility at Lake Nona and what uh, the player development department's role is going to be with that facility, how you guys are going to be using the facility, especially as it pertains to juniors and college players. Got it. Great. Well, let me start and then, you know, feel free to stop me or we can get into specifics, but just to give a little bit of background, um, about four years ago, the organization started looking for a bigger facility for player development. Um, we, we have had a great relationship with the Everett Academy and we've shared their facility, um, there for the last nine years where we had a building, uh, we had a gym and we had, we had courts. We had about, we had access to a minimum of three hard and three clay courts every day, but, um, usually more whenever we needed them. Um, then over the course of a year, year and a half, um, the organization um, identified Lake Nona, Orlando, as the best as the best location uh, for a new facility. Um, we had a, we built a great relationship with the state of Florida and with the city of Orlando. Um, we also developed a relationship with a development group here called Tavistock, um, who owned the land. And then as that process evolved, um, the leaders of the organization decided that, you know, instead of it just being for player development, that this could be a campus um, that could really house all of the departments in the organization that deliver the game. So whether it's league tennis or a tenant under tennis, recreational, wheelchair tennis, that this could be a place where not only our staff lived and worked, but that we could also kind of create a living laboratory and a showcase for best practices. So at that point, um, you know, the vision really expanded um, to include community tennis um, and a lot of other departments in the USTA that, um, that in some way deliver the game. So, you know, fast forward um, to a week ago um, when the campus opened, uh, the official opening was last Thursday. Um, the campus opened um, with the Welcome Center, which is the community tennis headquarters here on campus. Um, league folks, coaching ed, community tennis, the foundation, um, and player development. Um, all on the same campus that it, that includes a hundred courts, um, hard true, hard red clay, indoor, and pretty much anything that you can imagine that is necessary to support the development of a tennis player. Um, so from so that's kind of where we are. That's what the facility represents. Um, in talking about juniors and, you know, our philosophy and our approach uh, for working with junior players and college players, um, over the last five or six years, we've really developed a, a very collaborative system with all 17 geographic sections where we evaluate junior players between the ages of 11 and 13 um, at camps. So players are invited to camps all, all across the country. Um, they train with a blend of private sector coaches and national coaches. Um, we have parent education at those camps. We have coaching education at those camps. 
Uh, we have a character quality component at those camps. And then the evaluation goes back to the private coach. And we kind of identify some areas that we think the player could improve, improve on. Uh, we share them with the private coach. We don't dictate to them, but we share them. And then we'll typically see those players three to four times a year. So it's a very progressive, iterative process of camps. Every year, the process starts new. So we try to be as fluid as possible. So if we have late maturing kids or kids that play other sports or kids that are, you know, great athletes and maybe developing a little bit slower, that we have the ability to bring them into the system um, at the beginning of every year. And the selection process for those camps is done in conjunction with private sector coaches in every section because we know that they know the players um, better than we do. So that's the that's the junior piece. I, I'll pause there and see if you have any questions about that, Lisa. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would love to hear more about how the juniors get selected for the camps. And um, you mentioned that it's done through their private coaches uh, back home, but are there certain private coaches that you guys work with specifically? So let's say, you know, a, a family is looking to have their child on that developmental pathway where, you know, they eventually are, are getting down to Lake Nona to train with y'all. Are there certain coaches they should be working with in their section? How do they find out who those coaches are? Or can a parent bypass the coaches and, and apply directly with you guys to get their kids into a camp? Great questions. Um, so, you know, what we always are trying to do is to make sure that the processes associated with selecting players are as objective and transparent as possible. Um, so in all 17 sections, um, we've got a USTA section staff person for player development. So there's a, there's a USTA person in that section um, who's responsible for operations related to player development, junior tournaments, camps, what have you. In addition to that, we work together with that player development staff person to create a coaches commission of private sector coaches, the best private sector coaches in that section um, who have a variety of skill sets. So in that commission, we want to see coaches who have a track record of developing nationally ranked players. We want to see some tendon under coaches, we want to see coaches who work in diverse areas, um, and we want to see coaches who have gone through some type of continuing ed training. So we, we work, our, our national office, um, our player ID and development department headed up by Kent Kinnear, works with the player development staff person and the coaches commission to make the selections for each camp. And as a rule of thumb, that um, we base about 70% of those selections on ranking um, and about 30% of them based on recommendations from the Coaches Commission. And when you say ranking, you mean USTA ranking? USTA ranking, that's correct. Okay. I just I want to make sure that parents who are listening understand how this process works so that, you know, there's no confusion. And, and I know there's, you know, in the past, there's been a lot of griping about, you know, USTA playing favorites and my kid isn't getting noticed and isn't getting the perks from USTA. So there is now a very clear-cut process for getting included in, into these camps and, and getting to go down to this training facility. Um, so for for parents, I guess the recommendation I'm hearing from you, Martin, is contact your player development rep in your section. Let them know that you have an interest in, you know, having your kid looked at and then 
the player development person will then make the determination if your child has what it takes either ranking-wise or sees some potential there, uh, some drive there, some athleticism there that warrants a spot in one of these camps. Is, am I saying that correctly? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think I, I would say that parents should get clarification from their PD staff person about, you know, what what developmentally um, we're looking for at the section level. Um, but I really would want to underscore that, you know, as a, as a parent myself of four kids, you know, the focus should really be on the process of getting better. Um, if, if, the, if the player is playing tournaments, um, they're going to be seen by, by coaching commission members. Um, and there's no, there's no way to kind of work, work the system or there's, it, it doesn't help if you know the PD manager. It doesn't help if you're good friends with the coaches, commission, coach. Um, so I, I, the one thing I don't want parents to feel like somehow there's a way to gain access. But I would say that, you know, to look at us and to look at your section as a resource for developmental guidance, um, if that if if that makes sense. Well, I think you know what's happened under your purview, Martin, which I think is such a great thing, is there's so much more transparency in the process now, and you know the fact that these PD reps are in every section, that there's a coaching commission in every section, and so you know, the onus then is on the parents to know who those people are in their section, to make mm -hmm. contact with them, and to seek out um, guidance and, and information from them, all the while ensuring that their child is on the right path, that, you know, it's something the child wants, that, you know, the child is willing to put the work in, that they have the requisite basic skill set, that they're with sure. good coaches and all of those sure. things. So um, that's, that's a huge improvement. Um, and I think the, the access to USPA player development has really opened up under your, under your leadership. So thank you for that. I think that's a huge improvement. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, this, you know, the system isn't perfect, but I'm a big believer in being transparent, being objective, and being as inclusive as possible when it comes to when it when it really comes to just being responsive, like you said, um, to making sure that parents have access to information about what they should be doing um, from a technical perspective, from a tournament schedule perspective. Um, We've got really, really good resources. You know, we have a quarterly Team USA webinar uh, once a quarter that's really geared towards parents, uh, towards coaches. And Lisa, what, one thing I'd like to do is to make sure you've got, you and your viewers and your listeners have the information for those webinars, but we're constantly looking for new and better ways to, uh, to share resources with, with our stakeholders. Which are which are players, parents, and coaches, right? And yeah, I've I've tuned into almost all of the webinars, and um, I I get the transcripts after and share those through our various social media outlets. So, yeah, I think those are great, and um, some have been better than others, of course. And I'm looking sure. forward to seeing what's coming in 2017. But yeah, I think you know these are all steps that. Um, are working toward actually making parenting aces obsolete, which is a good thing because the only reason I exist is because people were frustrated not being able to get the information from you guys. So if you guys are, are doing such a great job of providing the information, um, you know, I, I'm thrilled. I mean, that, that was one of the goals of, of starting parenting aces in the first place was, you know, hopefully getting USTA to recognize that parents are hungry for the information and, and y'all are doing a great job of, of really building those resources and making them accessible. So kudos. Great. 
Well, we're, we'll continue to try and, um, you know, always let me know if you see an area where you think we can improve. Um, and, you know, for all your listeners, um, we're always open to construct, constructive criticism. We want to get better. One question I have for you in, in relation to the juniors, and, and I don't know if you've seen it, but Colette Lewis did a great piece for Tennis Recruiting on the new facility. It's kind of a, a pictorial article. She has a bunch of photos of the different aspects of the facility with descriptions of what's there, and it looks incredible. And she also included in her piece a schedule of upcoming events, which – you know, I didn't realize this, but you guys are going to be hosting not only junior tournaments but and college matches, but also league play, tennis on campus, um, all sorts of community events. So one of the questions that, that came up from one of my readers actually for you is what type of access will juniors have to the pros who are training at your facility when they're down there for tournaments or camps or whatever reason they're down there? Will they be able to interact with the, the American pros that are training and, and I know even some international players that are training down there? Uh, great question. So one of the things that the facility gives us the ability to do is to be a lot more intentional of, about education and community service opportunities so there's some times during the year when we will have a, a good number of pros training here uh, typically mid-november to early december uh, we have our preseason training block before players go down to australia uh, we have a lot of players here then um, we hope to have a lot of players here training on the red clay after miami so one of the things we want to do is to take some of take some practices um, out into the campus um, so that kids and you know coaches and parents can see how how pros train and you know have a little bit of open time when you know the pros can interact with the folks that are on campus. Um, so we're going to be intentional about that. Um, we've got a really good relationship with um, the campus um, coaches who are going to be running the programming for children. So that's something that we've already discussed is kind of setting, setting some specific times and opportunities where pros can interact with the kids that are on campus. We, we, we will not be able to have um, juniors and, and outside people coming into the PD space uh, to watch that training because we want to be we want to be respectful of the pros' privacy, but we'll definitely design those opportunities um, in the greater campus. So, for example, there's a national level two event coming in February uh, to the campus. Will the kids that are there for that event? be you know able to wander around and watch any pros that might be on site or you know have any kind of interaction um other than playing their own matches um well they won't be able to wander around in the pd space um but they will be able they will be able to have a tour of the pd space and when they do have that tour we're going to try to make sure that we have pros training and we have some interaction that's designed and intentional. Um, so those are opportunities that we really are planning on capitalizing on. But no, it, it will not be open to kids or parents or coaches uh, coming into the PD area unless they're invited. Gotcha. We have a listener on the line. I'm going to just check in and see if they're just listening or maybe have a question. Uh, it's a listener from area code 310529. Um, did you have a question for Martin? Hey, Lisa. It's Susan. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm just well. You know who this is. It's Susan Nardi, right? I, absolutely. Hey, Susan Nardi. Did you have a question for Martin? Hi, Susan. No, I was just, hey, Martin, how are you, sir? 
I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? Southern Cal, right? Um, well, well, no, I'm the the beach girl will not let go of her uh, L.A. cell number. No, I'm actually in Texas. I saw you a couple of years ago when you were up in Dallas and you came and you spoke. Okay, great. And back then and uh, and stuff like that. No, I was actually listening. I couldn't get on my um, Wi-Fi uh, at home, so I was listening via the phone. No, I'm just I'm just sitting here listening. I don't really have any questions. I'm enjoying the conversation. Okay. Okay, great. I'm going to put you back. In but I appreciate you doing Thank that, you. Lisa and, and Martin. It's <laughs> nice to hear your voice, and congratulations on uh, everything that's going on. I think you're doing a fabulous job. Thanks, Susan. I appreciate it. Okay, so, Martin, let's segue into the college aspect of things and um, how PD is going to be working with either potential college players or existing college players to help them transition to the next phase in their tennis development? Sure. Um, you know, this is a really exciting area for us because I feel like it's just been in the last two or three years that we have looked at college tennis again and really tried to reimagine it as part of the pro pathway and be creative and think outside of the box. Um, especially in light of the fact that the average age of top 100 players is, is going up um, about 24 and a half on the women's side uh, for top 100 women and about 28 for top 100 men. So, um, you know, a lot of countries um, have a staff person who's dedicated to getting their best juniors into American colleges. Um, and if you look at the top 100 and you look at Stevie Johnson and John Isner and Nicole Gibbs and Arena Falcone, um, we definitely have representation of players who we know have really gotten better in college um, and been prepared to, for a professional career with very little investment um, by, the US, by USTA player development um, in college tennis. So over the last year, we've really increased our investment um, in that space and become a lot more systematic um, about helping players to develop while they're in school, working with coaches to make sure that they have professional play opportunities while they're in school, um, making sure that we're validating the college schedule um, by attaching automatic wild cards. Um, for the best finishing American players um, and adding two more coaches, two more national coaches um, to our collegiate department, which is led by Stephen Amitrash. So I, I see this as a huge area of opportunity. Um, and a big part of it, too, is just messaging and making sure that players who aren't quite ready to turn pro when they go into college know that they're going to have the financial and emotional support of player development um, while they're in college and when they come out. So um, I'm really excited. I'm really optimistic that we can get more and more um, of our top players coming out of college after, you know, one, two, three, four years um, and get them into the top 100 or, or farther. I want to just – clarify for listeners to Martin that player development responsibility is on the professional side of things. It's, it's finding and, and helping players develop to the point where they're successful on the professional level, right? Um, you guys are, it used to be that junior tennis and junior competition came under player development, but that's now separate. It's under community tennis. And so your role in player development is really focused on the next wave of professional players and taking care of the existing American professional players. Am I stating that correctly? Yeah. It, as it relates to professional players, yes, you have stated it correctly. So, you know, our purview goes down to 10 years old, 
you know, we have a, we have a programming, um, we, we have a programming event for 10 and under players, which are called early development camps. And those are half day camps, which are all about participation and education. Um, then we move into the camp structure that we spoke about at the beginning of the call. Um, then the funnel narrows when juniors are 15 or 16 years old. And we go by benchmarks um, that indicate players that are tracking to be top 100. And then we go to college and then we go to the pros. So as it relates to professionals, we've got two ways of supporting our top pros. One is that for a small percentage of them, we work directly with some of our professional players. Um, but for the vast majority of them, we work supplementally with them and we give them what we call performance team support. So Lisa, if you're, if you're ranked 50 in the world and, and you're doing well and you have a, you have a really good coach um, and you have a really good strength and conditioning person, but maybe you don't have a training base that you're happy with. Um, maybe you're not getting video analytics. Maybe you're not getting the mental skills training that you need. The discussion with you and your coach would be, hey, you know, USDA Player Development is here to help you. Um, we have this expertise. Is there any way we can help you? And we would help you in the areas in which you need it. So that's really the discussion that we try to have with all of our top players. Um, we try to create a team that has the highest level of expertise, but at the same time, we try to be as flexible um, in our approach and really customize our approach to helping each player. Fantastic. So let's get it, let's get back to college tennis a little bit. Um, one of the things you said is, you know, that players going to college for one, two, three, four years, um, you know, that y'all are really working and, and investing in that aspect of the game. One of the challenges from the parent side that I see myself, but I also hear about from my readers is, you know, that we, we American players are competing so heavily with international players for scholarship spots on college teams. And if you go to USTA's website, there's some data on there about, you know, the percent of players that are um, international versus American, yada, yada. But the data is pretty old. Just wondering if you guys are looking at that, um, looking at ensuring that there are opportunities for the American players who desire or need the college pathway to have spots to play and, you know, that there's scholarship money available to them. Sure, sure. I think that's a really big need and a really big challenge. And my, my approach um, to that challenge has been that our role as the NGB, as the Federation, should be to be as proactive and intentional as possible in creating opportunities um, for juniors to gain college placement. Um, and also to provide a little, to provide a demonstration effect of what we will do for our top American college players, which, which I think creates an incentive for coaches to recruit more American players. So I'll give you a few examples. Um, one is that this fall, I mean this spring, we're gonna have an American player junior combine only for American juniors, um, where we're gonna invite as many division one, two, and three coaches as possible to come and watch American juniors train and compete and to interact with them and to educate them about the universities. So that's an example of an opportunity that's only going to be available for American juniors. And we feel like that is going to, that, that is going to contribute 
and facilitate more American juniors being recruited. Another one is that for the Can wild I interrupt you one be- sec? Can yeah, I interrupt sure, you go one ahead. Sec? Sorry. Um, so how can players find out about that, and how will they be selected for that combine? Uh, it's going to be very, very, very inclusive. And I spoke with Stephen a couple days ago. So he's got he's going to roll out the marketing and the messaging for that combine in a couple weeks. So it's going to be brought. It's going to be very broadly disseminated, and I'll make sure Lisa that you and your viewers, uh, your listeners, uh, get that information. But it'll also flow to all 17 sections. Awesome. Okay. And I'm hoping to have Stephen on the show in the next few weeks, too. So that'll be a great topic of conversation for us. Okay. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, no. That's great. Yeah. St- Stephen is such a such an intelligent, entrepreneurial guy. Um, you're going to really love having him on the show. Um, and then the other thing is, is, again, another example is the wild cards that we give that are linked to the biggest ITA events the wild cards that we give to Futures and Challengers are only for the top finishing American in those tournaments. So, you know, if, if, uh, if an international player wins the ITA All-Americans or wins the ITA Indoors, we're going we're gonna to give that wild card opportunity to the highest finishing American player. Um, same goes for the summer team opportunities. Um, we touched 51 players yesterday, I mean last year, with our summer team programming where we help players on the Futures Tour and the Challenger Tour. That's only available for American players. So I hope that we're sending the message that, you know, the USTA player development is really putting resources against kids that are going into college, kids that are in college, kids that are coming out of college for the benefit of those programs, but that it's only for American players. So I'm, I'm hopeful that that has an impact, Lisa, um, and contributes to the increase of American kids that are recruited. That would be fantastic. I, I, I share your hope there. <laughs> I think that would be fantastic <laughs> for – for all of our kids and I, you know, we've talked about this um, a lot on Parenting Aces is, you know, college tennis is the carrot. I mean, that needs to be available in order to attract young families to the game, you know, in order to convince families to make the investment of time and money necessary to develop top players. College tennis has to be an option, a viable option, and college scholarship money has to be an option um, for these families because, you know, we talk a lot about the expense of developing a top player, and I know there are some exceptions, but for the vast majority of families, it is a massive investment, and, you know, to you don't want to go into it looking for – um, an ROI necessarily, but, you know, it, when you're looking at uh, the variety of sports available to our kids in the U.S., we're competing against sports that offer a lot of benefits down the road uh, in terms of financial benefit um, and don't cost, you know, nearly as much as our sport costs to sure. get the player sure. to a level, you know. So, um, you know, I'm I'm thrilled to hear that USTA is recommitting to college tennis, and and I know Stephen's doing a great job. I'm I'm looking very forward to interviewing him. But um, you know, I think it's it's awesome, and thank you again for your leadership in that capacity because um, you know this is something that kind of fell by the wayside for a few years. Sure, sure. Yeah. So um. Let's shift gears a little bit, Martin, and talk a little bit more um, about the facility. And is this a facility that is open to the public? So, for example, if, you know, if I'm making a trip down to Orlando and wanted to come, you know, play a match just for fun down there, would I have access to that? Absolutely. 
So the, the vast majority of the facility is a public facility. So all you'd have to do is go online, um, register for a court, register for a program, um, call, the, call the welcome desk um, here on campus, and we really want to make it as accessible and open as possible to anyone who wants to visit and, um, and play here. I mean, it's such a beautiful campus, um, you know, great cafes, great customer service. The retail space is beautiful. There's a stringing bar. There's so many different innovations. Um, 84 of the 100 courts are live streaming. Um, 26 so far have PlaySight, which is a state-of-the-art uh, technology in which cameras are mounted around the court and you get a real-time report on all of the analytics related to your game, ball speed, court position, um, you name it. So, yeah, it's, we, we want people to come down here and visit and play, make it into a destination vacation, um, but also to come down here and maybe look at the programming on the campus and and hopefully take something away from it as well because we want all the programming to reflect best practices. Is there a charge to come play? There is a charge. Um, I think it's, I think it's um, very reasonable. Um, I'm sorry to say I don't know what it is, um, but I believe it's somewhere around $10 an hour for a court. So part of the vision and the philosophy was to make everything on campus as affordable as possible, um, whether it's food or stringing or court time or programming. So when I looked at the price sheet um, earlier this week, the price, and I've been in this business for a long time, I'd say the pricing is just a notch below market. So very reasonable. Fantastic. You mentioned Play site and its presence at Lake Nona and Parenting Aces readers and listeners are should be familiar with Play site. Um, we've done a lot of coverage of, of their technology. They have a new thing that they launched recently, these Playfair tournaments. And I'm wondering, since the technology is on so many courts at the new facility, will the tournaments being held there use it and use that whole play fair approach where uh, players can actually challenge line calls? Um, I've seen some video on those play fair tournaments and I think they're great. I think it raises the level of accountability for both players. And I love the fact that two juniors can kind of self-regulate by going and looking at the replay. Um, we don't have enough uh, smart courts right now, I think, to have a full tournament that would be play fair. Um, but I could definitely see as the relationship with play site evolves um, and the cost for installation comes down, I could definitely look into the future and see that as a possibility. I think that would be great. I actually had the opportunity to watch a Playfair tournament at USC a few months ago, and it was it was really cool. It, it completely changed the vibe of a typical college tennis event, and uh, I'd love to see it implemented at more junior tournaments. I, I know the cost is expensive right now, but as you said, hopefully the cost will continue to come down and um, – you know, you guys will be able to kind of take the lead in promoting that type of event. I think it's it's good for junior tennis, and we hear a lot of, you know, from families saying that their kids quit tennis because they don't like the the cheating. They don't like, you know, the, the bad calls and, and the gamesmanship that goes on, and so maybe this would be a way to eliminate some of that and hold on to some of these, new players as they get exposed to tournament play. Yeah, I think that's so important, Lisa. I mean, that those first couple experience, uh, tournament experiences for 
young players and also for families that aren't familiar with the game. If they have a bad experience with cheating, um, it can really drive them out of the game. So, um, you know, in addition to the technology, we've got a widespread initial sportsmanship initiative um, in the organization. And I know it's going to be the focus for the officials group. And, you know, we're going to look for ways to really, to really minimize that type of experience because um, no, but it's not good for anybody. Right. Well, I promised my listeners that we would touch on the junior comp changes that went into effect January 1 this year. And, um, again, I want to just reiterate the fact that junior competition does not fall under the purview of player development any longer. It's, it's a separate area of USTA, but certainly you have a stake in it, um, player development has a stake in the junior competition structure in our country and, and its role in developing players and helping players reach their highest potential. So, you know, do you have a take? I mean, and, and, and let me also just add Martin that because you have coached at every level of the game, you understand so many of the intricacies of player development from you know the recreational level all the way up to the highest levels at the professional game what role does the junior competition kind of structure network play in helping us get more of our players at a higher level in the game well i think I think it's, it has at least three roles. I think role number one and focus number one should be retaining players. So I think a good junior comp structure, the first thing that a good junior comp structure does or facilitates is the retention of players who like to play tennis. Um, so I think a big part of that is to have – different pathways and different levels within the system um, so that you can meet the preferences, not only of players, but also of families. So I think that's really where, you know, when we're talking about recreational tennis, players who play other sports and, you know, want to play maybe six or seven tournaments a year, um, players who play in a certain season. I think, I, I think sometimes in player development, we discount the importance of those players, but I think you need to retain as many of those players to keep the system healthy. Because what, what happens is, is the more players you have at the base of the system, uh, the more opportunity and the more probability you have of the players with the athletic ability and other skills um, to jump into the to the next pathway. So you've got that recreational pathway, you've got that competitive pathway, which I think represents you know the vast majority of kids who play tournaments. And the at the end of that pathway, we really want to see college tennis. And then you've got a small percentage who move up into that high performance pathway. Um, and typically those, those players are at the top of the game, of the junior game, by the time they're 15, 16, or 17, and they're starting to play ITF tournaments and pro tennis. So they're basically using some of the biggest national tournaments as just part of an optimal schedule. So, um, you know, I think there, you know, there were some changes made last year which opened the system up, um, but at the same time still preser preserved um, the pathway of earned advancement within the section. Um, but they opened the system up so that players who play other sports or get injured um, can come back into the national pathway a little bit sooner with a little bit more ease. So I think it was a good I think it was a good balance. 
What about increasing the number of ITF junior events in the U.S. so that the American juniors have more opportunities to play the international players on home soil? And again, since they are competing with the international kids for spots on college teams, you know, is this is this a logical thing that needs to happen for these kids to have exposure to the international players in the junior years before they are competing for those spots on the college teams? I think it's really important. Um, I think that the number of ITF, American ITFs that we have on the schedule right now is about right. Um, I think the danger in trying to have more American ITFs is that we see a lot of kids who are chasing ITF points. And even if they're doing it in the States, I think in general is to the detriment of their education. And I think it puts a tremendous amount of financial pressure on families. Um, so I think the fact that American ITFs also have national ranking points attached to them is is a really good um, synergy that we identified early on. And I think that, you know, for a top junior, if they want to play three or four American ITFs along with the biggest sectional and national tournaments and maybe a few futures event, futures qualities events uh, just for the experience, um, I think that's an unbelievable schedule that's pretty easy to put together. What about the the whole concern about having to miss so much school to play tournaments? And you just yeah. mentioned that with, you know, in conjunction with the ITF events that are held during the week. But what if we had American ITF events during the summer when kids are out of school and, you know, how does a family that wants to keep their child in traditional school, you know, doesn't want to go the virtual school route, how do they make their way through the system? It's it's very difficult um, to get high-level competition and stay in regular school because so many of the tournaments either start on a Friday and end on a Monday or a Tuesday or Again, the ITF events, which run during the week. What do you say to those families? I mean, I, it's very difficult and it's very expensive. Um, there's no way around that. But I, I do think that if the goal is for the player to get better, if that's the ultimate goal is for the player to develop as a player, play at the right level and get better, I would just really encourage parents to look for opportunities in their area and put a schedule together that works for their educational um, preferences and demands, that works for their budget, um, and that works for some balance and, and social, you know, socialization um, for their kid. I mean, I'll give you a great example. It's you know, Taylor Fritz, one of our top young men um, who had an amazing year last year, finished, I think, about 77 ATP. Taylor didn't start playing ITFs until he was 16 years old. Um, so I think, you know, I, I think there's a perception out there that you have to homeschool, you have to chase the ITF points, you have to do these things, but... I think we forget that if the player is getting better, then they can always play at the right level when the opportunity arises. I think that's you're a not gonna, point. You know what I mean? You're you're not gonna lose you're not gonna lose a college recruitment opportunity if you're doing well at a high level. And that level could be a national tournament in your section. That level could be a pro circuit tournament in your section. Um, that level could be the two or three ITFs that you are able to play. So it really always it comes down to the level of the player, and you know the focus should be on getting better. Great point. What is your 
view or your opinion of universal tennis rating and how that can be a part of the development process? Or, or are you familiar with it? I, I should. I, I am. Yeah, I, I think it's a. I think it's a great tool. Um, I think it's you know it's something that's been used in Europe for a long time, especially in France. Um, you know where they have a tournament system that uses a lot of pro- what they call progressive tournaments. So depending on your rating, you start at a different round in the tournament. Um, and I think it's a pretty objective way for a player to see what level they're at um, based on their competitive results. Um, now, there, there are going to be times when the player may be working on something in their game um, that's going to have great long-term benefit, but in the short term, it may mean that they lose to some players that they used to, that they used to beat. So that's something that the coach needs to be cognizant of. Um, but in general, it's probably the most objective measure of where your level is, you know, based on competitive matches, based on wins and losses. And what is your feeling on the whole idea of level-based play from the perspective of it doesn't matter what age your opponent is, what gender your opponent is, as long as it's a competitive match for you? I think that within a community, um, that holds true. Um, And I think think where it really holds true is in a club setting um, or at a, in a public program where the same people come and play and interact and socialize, um, where it's a safe place. I think that really holds true. Um, I remember when I was a kid coming up, a lot of the guys I came up with and girls who became great players played with, you know, players of an opposite gender, players who were older, um, it really didn't matter because they were getting competitive matches and it, it actually probably stimulated their development because you're playing against different game styles and against older people who have a lot more um, maturity and experience than you do. I think where it could be problematic is if it's not within a community, um, then you have, you know, obviously you've got a lot of variables when, um, when you have kids, kids of different ages, different levels of emotional maturity, 12 year old playing a a 30 year old man where you could have some issues. So I I think if it's in a controlled and safe environment, it brings, it brings a lot of benefit to, um, to players. Great. So we're down to about our last two minutes and I want to just make sure I give you an opportunity to, to say anything that I haven't asked about yet or um, to share any news or information that we haven't had a chance to touch on. So go. (laughs) Sure. Look, I mean, the, the one thing that I would share and I share whenever I can is that, you know, we are the governing body. We are the Federation player development um, is the arm of the organization that's responsible for supporting players and parents and coaches. Um, We're always trying to get better. Our staff is passionate and committed to helping as many players as we can. And at the end of the day, we're here to serve you. And I think lots of times people get the impression that, you know, we're kind of dictating or mandating or we have an our way or the highway approach. And I just want to say that's definitely not the culture. Um, It's not my leadership approach. Um, I see our role, I see my role um, as a service role. My job is to serve American players and coaches and parents, and I just would love for all your listeners uh, to take that away um, because um, that is definitely the case. 
And I, I want to reiterate the fact that, Martin, you are incredibly responsive anytime I've reached out to you via social media, email, whatever it is. And I suspect, you know, I'm not getting any sort of special treatment um, that you are like that with everyone. And so for, for my listeners, follow Martin on Twitter, you know, Facebook friend him. Um, he is accessible And if he doesn't have the answer, he's pretty quick to point you in the right direction to get the answer. And so, Martin, I want to, again, thank you for your willingness, uh, your transparency, and the expertise that you're bringing to player development. And I, I just, you know, I hope we continue to see great improvements in American tennis. I really appreciate it, Lisa, and I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, for your listeners and the forum that you created and the resources that you've created for them. So thanks so much for um, giving me this opportunity. Well, thanks for being with us today. To my listeners, thank you so much for tuning in and hope you've enjoyed the show. Martin, again, Happy New Year, wishing you all the best in 2017. And we'll be looking at the progress of our Americans in Australia as the Australian Open gets going next week. Qualies are underway now, so pretty exciting stuff. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next week on Parenting Aces. Thanks, Lisa. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good health insurance doesn't have to be expensive. At AmBetter from Peach State Health Plan, our plans are better for your budget. We provide complete care at a much lower cost. And you may qualify for financial assistance to help pay for your coverage. Sign up for the most affordable care today. Call 1-844-292-4328. That's 1-844-292-4328. This is a solicitation for insurance.